sort of snapshot really of the things um, that you know have happened over uh, the last um, nine years. I think one of the things that, that came across there was that the, the message from Heather Duggan who talked about the fighting spirit. But that's exactly what we've had, I think, that's um, kept us going from 2010 onwards. Uh, to today is that is that fighting spirit. We're going to need um, much more of that. I've, I think everybody's got a copy of the midterm financial plan. Yes, but, yes the, the, it's attached to your note. You'll see the midterm financial plan. I was actually quite surprised that nobody picked it up. I mean, it's it sets out in real detail uh, the issues, the problems that we face. It gives us lots of information. Uh, around um, the, the funder reductions and the things that we uh, have as problems in terms of, you know, it, it clearly is an important document and I just urge everybody to read that. It went to Cavs, um, I think about well, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, um, and I'd ask everybody to have a look at it. The, the underlying issue for, for us as, as a city is that, you know, and there's no way of of um, you know dressing this up. We've dealt with four hundred million pounds worth, over four hundred million pounds worth of cuts uh, since uh, two thousand and ten. And as I've just set out the problems that we face uh, are not over. Um, we still have to find uh, those commitments that we've made this year and, and as I said what we do know is uh, by 2020-21 at least another uh, 25 million. You'll have seen the announcement made by uh, the Chancellor um, just before the prorogation of, of Parliament where he, he talked about his investments and again used the phrases that austerity is over and going to invest. I, I think the only thing that we uh, can see out of that is um, potentially money for us in terms of the better care fund. We were frightened about uh, not getting the better care fund for 2020-21 and that would have uh, really crippled us but it looks like they haven't yet agreed the formula but if they just distribute it on the numbers in care or, or on a formula that they currently use, then we should be um, possibly around about seven million uh, thereabouts, between seven and eight million uh, better off. So that has uh, helped in terms of, but clearly we've got a quarter of a billion pound that is spent every year on adults and children's social care quarter of a billion pounds, 62% of our budgets, our income coming in goes on paying for social care. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, a welcome um, seven million pounds, but it's nowhere near uh, what we need. I think also, we, we looked at that, I, I mentioned this to somebody, that if we if we look at um, you know, what we would get if we closed every children's centre, every library, every leisure centre, stopped maintaining our parks and turned off all the lights in the city and didn't have any lights, we'd probably get in around about 67 million in total. So again, it shows you the problems uh, that we face. But what I think we've done as, a, as an administration is we've been bold and we've been innovative and we've been imaginative in what we've done as a city. And I think we've got to do more of that. We've got to actually keep continuing to do the things uh, that we uh, have done in the past and continue to make sure uh, that we do in the future. Because I think it's important, and, and I think it's important to reflect on and remember that the decisions that we make today are 
decisions that will impact on the city, not just today, but in years to come. And I, that leads me, if you like, to two points that I want to make, because whilst I welcome the opportunity to work cross-party to present to government, we can't hide from the fact that for 10 years now, just under 10 years, five of those where we were bludgeoned came from the coalition government and then has been continued by this government in terms of continuing to hit this city the hardest out of any other city. Hit the hardest because we're the least in terms of bringing in revenue because of the council tax base. And I often always try to when, you know, I, and I say um, this with um, anger really, when I, um, a couple of weeks ago, heard Councillor Makinson talking about how badly run our council is and was, you know, according to him. I remind him and I remind the people that during the period of 1993 to 2000, the Liberal Democrats had a moratorium on council tax of 0%, 0%, 0%, 0%. And then in the final year, trying to win votes, they cut the council tax by 3%. And that's about £23 million a year. But in total, to our base budget, it's around about £340 million a year that we've lost, that we would have today. So it's important that we remember what we also inherited, the overspend, the capital culture bill, 18 million in adult social care, all of these things, single status equal pay, not tackled, all of these things added to the burden and the finances that we've seen in the video picked up. Bottom line is, is that our council was labelled as a one-star council by the Audit Commission. The famous picture of the bottom bad in this steps on uh, the Lone Star State. Under no time has our council, under this administration, under a Labour administration, have we ever been challenged for financial mismanagement or incompetence. On the contrary, on the contrary, we've been told by people that we are financially one of the best run councils in the country despite the challenges that we face. But it is good, finally, that we actually have now got people talking about working together to solve and help find solutions to the problems that we face. It's good that we are join them to actually say to government together with our trade unions, with our voluntary sector, with the director of finance, the chief executive, go to approach government to say we now need your help, we desperately now need more help. So that's what today is about for us to look at those particular um, strategies and tactics of how we can engage to get them to understand because that 64% is a £436 million a year loss and you know and I know that not me saying it but other people, um, reputable people, people who represent uh, people that have no axe to grind have said that Liverpool has been the hardest hit. And for each and every family, it's the loss of £834 uh, pound a year. And we can also uh, remember and recall the European racketeer who was here that talked about the poverty levels in this city. And one in three families living in poverty, one in three children living in poverty and universal credit and all the issues that face us on top of the problems that we face as a city, but the people in our communities face every single day. Every single
single day behind closed doors. People are making decisions on when they can buy a school uniform for their kids or feed their kids. And as we head to winter, they'll be deciding whether they keep their house or eat at all. That is the reality of austerity. And it is, without a doubt, a political, political decision. It is a political choice of this government to make the decisions that they make. So we await to see whether the money uh, that has been promised with austerity being over actually materialises. In the meantime, in the meantime, it's down to us to protect the vulnerable, to protect those most in need, but to continue to make sure that we grow the city's economy. And I actually want to um, just talk to you a little bit about the bold approach that we had as a city. And I often get so angry and so frustrated by people in this city not understanding what it is we've achieved, what it is we've done, how we've protected. If you look at the libraries that have been closed, 480 libraries across the country. If you look at the children's centres, 460 children's centres. If you look at what we've been able to maintain as a result of our strategy of invest to aim, that has brought us to where we are today, that we are still, after nine years, we've lost two and a half thousand jobs. Yes, our streets are as clean, our parks are as well maintained, but we are still fighting, we are still standing, we are still strong, and we are still going to fight and continue to fight for our city. But let's just look at what we've been able to do, despite those challenges, despite that uh, housing market renewal fund that being taken away from us. Let's just look at what we've done, because there's 20,000 kids now in new schools in the city. Be proud of that as an administration, 20,000 kids in new secondary schools. But look at the £16 million pound now we get in council tax a year, £16 million pound a year more now than we used to get in 2011 as a result of the houses that we've built. In business rates, remember Ed Lane stalled in a legal dispute when uh, I became leader and we could become the administration. We unlocked that. We're only a third of the way through on the development of Ed Lane and we get now £3.3 million pound in council tax. In Speak Retail Park, and the development of Speak Retail Park and the business growth in Speak, we now get £7 million. £16 million in terms of the council tax that we now bring in. Finch Farm, I think I remember Councillor Lincoln's given me stick over Finch Farm. £3 million clear profits, 800000 a year that we get by way of return. And yesterday, yesterday, I was happy to receive a cheque from a company that invested in John Lennon Airport and Carla Partners, who bought 45% stake in John Lennon. And the £2 million investment that we made is increased by tenfold. So yesterday we received a cheque for £19.5 million for that £2 million. That's the City Council that is mismanaged and doesn't know what it's doing. £19.5 million pound that we'll invest to actually try to reduce the costs of children's care by building facilities to get children out of accommodation that will place them elsewhere and building them here so that we can actually save money or provide better facilities and better care for our look after children and our children with special needs. That's a fantastic achievement, an amazing achievement. Not only did it protect the airport and safeguard the jobs, imagine Liverpool, an international city, a global city, without an international airport. Just doesn't bear thinking about. Well, not only have we got one, 
and we've secured those jobs. We've got 19 and a half million pounds. But you know what? But the best of it is, we've still got a 10% stake in the airport. So in three years' time, we can cash that in if we want, but we've still got a 10% stake in the airport. So again, it shows if we do things with bold imagination, without actually taking risks, doing ethical investments, we can actually try to help protect the people of this city from the ravages of a Tory austerity. That's what we are about. That is what we do. And there will also be a report that uh, we'll be asking for approval tonight at council meeting, which is about an investment board. And that investment board is going to invest the public sector works loan board money to actually bring in a return for this city called Sensible Socialism. It's about using that money, bringing in that money and distributing it in a way that protects services and people from the ravages of austerity. So that's all in total an extra £41 million a year that we are bringing in this administration over what we've done over the last nine years. £41 million and rising, and rising Paddington Village when the first phase is complete, will bring in about £7.5 million in business rates. Ed's Lane is only a third complete, with much, much more to come around Bramley Moor, the developments on the docks from Bramley Moor, right the way through to the Garden Festival, gives opportunities for our city, not only to grow and create jobs, but to bring in the finances that sustain us going forward. But let's be clear, let's be absolutely clear that that doesn't give me comfort. That doesn't give me comfort that we're getting that money in to support those services and we're letting the Tory government off the hook for giving us what is rightly ours and what we should have. Because when we put up the council tax by 1% in this city, it brings us in £1.75 million a year. If Surrey do it, if Surrey put up a council tax by 1%, it brings them in £7.6 million a year. And they haven't got the problems that we face. And I also make the point around Bristol. We've got 40 odd thousand more people in this city than Bristol has. And yet Bristol get £38 million a year more than us because of the council tax bans. So we have to make the case to government that we need assistance and we need, we need change. 2020-21 brings serious problems for us. Not only if we can't manage uh, the funding that we require and we need, potentially, potentially, there is a possibility that the protection that I negotiated, not just for Liverpool but for the city region, under the no detriment clause of business rates retention in the pilot scheme that we're in, potentially that ends. And that would mean that we would also be in serious difficult position as we lose that protection, I think it's probably around about 17 million a year, that we actually get protected by having that no detriment clause. So we do face serious, serious problems. And I'm glad that people uh, are joining together to present our case uh, to central government. And if we stick together, we can also come up with ways of managing, but also ways of persuading them with our MPs in Parliament and with us as leaders and our trade union colleagues, faith leaders, the voluntary sector, taking the case to government, hopefully they will listen because we simply have not got now any reserves or any way to manoeuvre and that's why it's important that we have this debate and that's it's important why we have this discussion and everybody in the chamber understands the seriousness of the problem we face. So from my contribution for now, Lord Mayor, that's it. Uh,
Um, but I'm happy to come back and discuss further after other people have made contributions or answered any questions. Thank you, Mayor Anderson. Can I please introduce Mark Crichton, our Director of Finance and Resources, who's going to do the next presentation?
a hitting social curl. This means that since 2010, we've been able to make 420 million pound of reductions in spend, or increased income through invest to earn projects, such as the Commercial Property Investment Fund, which is on the agenda later. All this at the same time as we've seen increasing demand for services. For example, looks after children have increased by 500 or 50% since 2010. So if we approve, or if you approve, the uh, Commercial Property Investment Fund, what that does is give us the opportunity to generate an income for the council similar to other invest to earn projects that we've done. And any purchase or subsequent disposal within that fund will be the subject to very close scrutiny and can only be done within the confines of the framework set out in the report. But addressing that £57 million budget gap is not going to be an easy task. And the relatively easy ways of balancing the books are not available to us anymore. Over the last 10 years, the council has been able to utilise reserves these now stand at 16 million and have been reduced by 36% over the last three years. We've gone as far as we can, especially with the levels of uncertainty increasing. Hence the need to set a one year budget rather than a three year budget, as levels of funding for local government are unknown beyond next year. And the methodology of distribution to individual councils as that funding is also unknown. With the options for how to solve the issue reducing, difficult decisions are going to need to be taken. As a council, we've got a legislative responsibility to set a balanced budget, and I personally have a statutory responsibility to ensure that happens. Reserves have been used, we've done as much salami slicing as we can, and setting an unbalanced budget is not an option. The current position in this financial year is showing a forecast overspend of £15 million. If this does become a reality, we'll need to utilise all of that general fund balance I've just talked about to solve this financial year. If we do that, we'll immediately need to put that money back into reserves and that will add another £15 million onto the 57. Not only that, but it will open us up to criticism for a government and the potential for the commissioners to be brought in. However, you're not alone in this process. We, as officers, will be helping to identify where savings and investor save or earn opportunities can be found. We'll provide you with training and we'll guide you in setting a budget and the process that's involved. Thank you, Mel, for that insight into the big picture. The first debate will be regarding uh, Joe's contribution, and that will be, um, which perhaps Bradford's still not here anyway, it'll be for the leaders from the party. Uh, and also, can people please indicate if they wish to speak? Joe, can I come back to you, please? No, I, I just so only, the only point I, I want to make is, is that, uh, as I said, for those of us that were at uh, audits and governments when uh, we uh, received the annual audit letter, uh, it, it pointed out the concerns uh, about the low levels of, of uh, general uh, reserve balances, as uh, I say, 16 million, and I think. But it's just important to point out that uh, where we are with the local government act today uh, in comparison to years gone by is that the government have the right if they feel that we are managing the budget or setting uh, a, a legal process in order to manage the following year they can immediately send in the commissioners and the commissioners are officers who just simply manage the system in the way that they see fit so they wouldn't be uh, sticking to any principles or values that we have 
It would just be simply the easiest way to chop and cut without looking at any opportunity. So I just, I just want to make that particular point that we have a, uh, obviously the Section 151 officer has a uh, fiduciary duty, a legal duty to set a balanced budget, but so do we uh, as a council. As I said, otherwise the commissioners come in. And there's a possibility, and I only flaunt this, there's a possibility that if we do have to use those reserves and we can't manage uh, that £25 million uh, overspend uh, for this year in terms of where we are for this year alone, and we have to use it, then that could possibly happen. I'm not putting that as a scare or whatever, but, but we don't know. Uh, we've seen that with Northampton, we've seen that with, with other uh, authorities, that that's a real danger uh, that that could happen. But that's because we simply have uh, no income coming into management mm -hmm. services that we currently provide. And that is statutory services, by the way. And, and don't forget, we've had to reduce spending statutory services. But that point that I make, that 170 odd million that we get in council tax, is just about covering adult social care spending. And on top of that, we have 80 odd million pounds for children's services. So our council tax goes nowhere near covering those two areas. That then you've got to think about the libraries, the leisure centres, the parks, the street cleansing, the street lighting, paying for the electricity, running services, paying for staff, all of those things that have to come out of business rates and the other taxes that we have, like for instance car park charges and those things, which is really to emphasise that point. Thank you, Neil Anderson. Can we now take contributions from Councillor Richard Kemp? Thank you, uh, my Lord, and I don't want anyone to think that anything that I say would detract from the seriousness of the situation that this council finds itself in today. I would just say, though, in terms of the presentation, that we must also always bear in mind two things when we compare this council with Surrey. Surrey is twice the size of this council in terms of population, etc. So you'd expect it to be at least twice, uh, to get at least twice the benefit from a council tax increase as we would. And it's one of the ever prosperous London and South East councils who are the government after government have always got the cream. I've been last week in Torbay and four weeks ago I was in Cornwall. And I can assure you that I received, as part of the work I was doing with our leaders there, almost identical presentations. So this isn't just a problem for Liverpool, this is a problem for local government. The biggest problem that I think we have is the fact that we have a totally centralised state in this country. Some say that we are the most centralised state outside of, of, in the EU apart from Malta. Malta disagrees. But the fact is that this council, like every other, suffers from a year by year by year approach from central government to the money that it gets. If we're lucky, we have a comprehensive spending review for three years and if we're even luckier, that sticks. Because so often we've had three year comprehensive spending reviews that have then been knocked around with within almost months of them being approved. And my thought to the government is this if you can approve a 40 year spending programme for your nuclear submarine fleet, and if you can agree a 60 year funding programme, to support private sector building nuclear reactors to power fuel, why can't you give us three or five years every time to enable us to plan effectively? Because the fact is that it doesn't matter who it is, if you can't think long term or at the very least mid term, you will waste money because you don't know, because you're second guessing what might come along, what you might have to do. And this is probably the most inefficient way of spending taxpayers' money uh, imaginable. 
The only thing I'd like to say, which Mary Anderson has alluded to, is talking about the tax funding situation and the way that it affects the city. Because I believe this is one of the things we really have to go united on to the government. But this isn't anything <coughs> new. Uh, I'm probably the only one that remembers this, certainly in this council chamber. When I was a lad and came here in 1975, we still had the same basic system that we have today. <coughs> Two types of property tax. A business property tax, which was always unfair given the type of business that we have here, and a residential property tax, which was almost as unfair then as it is now with the current rate of banding. And the fact is that, with the exception of Margaret Thatcher making two changes to the way we assess what money we should get, one introduced in 1990 and then corrected in 1991 for 92, we have a system which is not fit for purpose, which no government of any party has been prepared to deal with. And that has a huge effect on this <coughs> you will probably be aware that the council tax levels are set by the district value of, uh, the district value the district valuation office at 1991 rent levels just think about that 1991 15% of our city didn't exist in 1991 go along the docks so we have there not always very prosperous blocks, but some very prosperous blocks indeed, assessed on a rent level, uh, a rental level in 1991, which related to the tower blocks that used to live there. Actually, if there was a revaluation just of the property tax, incompetent and inefficient though it is, that would bring a lot more money in because it would more fairly share the burden. And those, that, that's the sort of thing we have to go to the government. And the original plan, uh, my Lord Mayor, was to revalue council tax, uh, the, the, the banding levels, every seven years. So it was introduced in 1991, so that was 1998, 2005, 2012. We should be on our third revaluation now. And that has not happened. Why? Because when they did it in Wales, there were winners and losers. And the winners never too bothered about this, they benefited. The losers paid more council tax and punished the Welsh Assembly and Government there. So those are the big overarching issues against which we have to, to, to plan. The wrong type of tax system delivered in the wrong way over the wrong time scale. Now, I could spend a lot of time going through my ritual attack on the last Labour government. I can tell you with some detail that 80% of the tax cuts in the first three years of the coalition attributed to the coalition were actually in Gordon Brown's last budget. I can tell you what was in your 2010 manifesto, which would have had more cuts than anything brought in by the coalition. But I don't see the point. We can argue about things, things till the cows come home. I've got facts from into, uh, the, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which proves what the, the, that point is. But it doesn't take us any further forward today. And that's why I actually think that the most important part of this agenda will be introduced by the Chief Executive when he talks about alternative ways uh, of doing things. But I want to go to the government not with a begging bowl, although we're absolutely sure in agreeing with the mayor that we do need more money. No ifs, no buts, no equivocation. We need more money for the city. But we have to go to them with an offer which they cannot refuse unless they are being totally unreasonable. And I just want to end with one point, because we've talked about the known unknowns, but there's an unknown unknown as well. The 
unknown unknown is the fact that we've got one year, that we don't know what's happening to business rate retention, a whole series of other things which we can not factor into the budget for the year after, but we can think about. What we don't know, and here I have to apologise, is what's going to happen with Brexit. There is no such thing as a good Brexit. Every commentator, every economic commentator rather, who has looked at this, with the exception of Professor Patrick Minford, who I wouldn't use to count my loose change, has said that any Brexit is bad for this country. And in particular, it will be bad for the poorest areas and the poorest communities. When we sit here this time next year, or perhaps a little later, we might be looking at today as being a teddy bear's picnic, a walk in the park. If we leave the EU, I have no idea how this city will survive, and I have no idea how many of the communities in this city will begin to survive. So I end on that note of caution but also with a very positive note. I've deliberately not waved my arms around and tried to politicise this debate, but when we get to the uh, second section, I would look forward to saying that I work with the Lord Mayor, with every member here, to find the new ways, the interesting ways, the revolutionary ways in the right sense, so that when we go to government, we can say we're making you an offer that you would be insane to refuse. Thank you, Madam Thank you, Councillor Henry. Uh, could I invite Councillor Tom Crowley to speak? Thank you, Lord Mayor. As uh, colleagues may notice, I've uh, somewhat lost my voice, so I'll keep my comments extremely brief tonight. Um, I just want to say that we do obviously face an extremely precarious and uh, uncertain future at the moment. Um, as Richard alluded to, we've got Brexit along the way, which could end up being a no deal Brexit in just six weeks. The effects of global warming and climate breakdown are becoming increasingly apparent, and nearly a decade of austerity really is starting to take a toll on many of our communities. So we do need some certainty, and certainty that we can continue to provide the care and help that vulnerable people need in our city. And we need the government to make it very clear that they're not going to let things get any worse for us. They need to recognise that cuts have gone too deep and they're already leading to real suffering. And we don't want to have to withdraw any more vital services. So we need funding which covers the true cost of, of the need in Liverpool. We also have the challenge of protecting future residents of our city from climate breakdown. The urgency of the climate crisis is finally being grasped by politicians at all level, and now we need to act quickly to start moving towards zero carbon. Making the declaration is not enough. If we don't act now, we will have failed in our responsibility to future generations. There seems to be an almost infinite supply of money, both from the government and for this council, for road building and repairs. We now need to see similar financial.